This is Life Questions, a program that looks at life's issues through the lens of the Bible. And I'm your host, Bill Harris. With life being as complex as it is, we never outrun the issues that we have to have to discuss on this program. And so today we are joined by a local group of ministers who will share their wisdom and expertise. And they will be answering the questions that many of you viewers have sent to us. So I'd love for you to meet them right now. First, we have Pastor Bill Watson, who is of the Pentecostal Way Church in Van Wert, Ohio, and the it's called the, the Turn Right and Go Straight Recovery Ministry. That's I like right. that. Next, we have Pastor Russ Thomas of The Gathering Place and the New Creation Lutheran of Elida, Ohio. Then we have Pastor Dave Burkhart of Westminster United Methodist Church in Westminster, Ohio. And rounding off our panel today is Pastor Paul Hamrick of the Hope Chapel, Van Wert, Ohio, and the New Hope Recovery Ministry. Gentlemen, gentlemen we're happy to have you all with us today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having now, us. you know, what, what's unique is about, about you all is you are all involved in um, drug recovery efforts. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to just take a moment, we'll just go right down the list and tell us just, uh, you, you know, in one, two sentences about your particular drug recovery ministry so that the audience will know where you're coming from as we go forward in our conversation. Go Absolutely. Right well, we uh, started a, uh, a drug abuse uh, program uh, in Van Wert called Turn Right and Go Straight. We started probably about, uh, oh, about close to five years ago. Uh, we had a death of a son uh, who was uh, in drugs wow. and he passed. Your and, son? or was Yeah, it was my son. Wow. And uh, being a pastor for over 30 years, that was quite devastating to me and my wife. But uh, I felt the Lord was impressing upon me to yeah. uh, help yeah. others not to find themselves in that situation. Yeah. And so I, I believe the Lord pressed upon my heart to help wow. those who were struggling with, uh, with drug abuse. All right, Pastor Thomas. Uh, yeah, uh, my church, The Gathering Place, spawned from my own addiction. And uh, from there, uh, we started the uh, Connected Hope bus ministry where we serve the homeless and the addicted. And then uh, my vocation is We Care Recovery Quality Housing, which uh, I administer a grant for the Mental Health Board for those seeking recovery housing for addiction. Okay, and Pastor Burkhart? Um, I'm less extensive than these guys, but uh, uh, about 11 years ago, I started working uh, with a church that uh, participated in a Bible study at the Worst Center, which is an addiction recovery facility here in Lima, out on Blue Lick Road, uh, that's actually an incarceration center. You have to be sentenced by a judge, and actually the judge allows you to go there if, if you uh, seem like that would be a good step for you. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, we haven't been there since May, since the whole COVID thing yeah, hit. Yeah. But uh, looking forward to getting back in there because it's been a great ministry. Excellent. Great Excellent. ministry. Pastor Henry. Uh, yes, um, I'm the pastor of Hope Chapel as well as director of New Hope Recovery. Uh, we started that 2007. Um, moved to Van Wert, uh, not realizing that uh, when probably 35, 40 years ago, I bought my first drugs in the main street in Van Wert. And God started bringing people into a little church with pastoring with uh, tattoos and uh, different colored hairs and drug problems. Okay, And the Lord kept uh, dealing with us. About three years ago, four years ago, we decided to go full time in mission and recovery, helping broken people find healing and hope. Wow, all right. And I hope you'll incorporate more about your, your facilities as, as we go on our conversation. Yes. But I guess the question I wanted to get an answer from is, the drug fight has been going on for a number of years. I remember when I started out as a television news reporter at Channel 13 in Toledo, doing stories then at age 24. And it, we still have this problem. Is it gotten, has the drug problem become worse? Is it getting any better? Is it just holding its own? Where are we? Who, who wants to answer that? How would you characterize it? Well, as, as far as what I've seen, um, the drug problem has just continued to escalate and escalate around this world. Uh, I think that there's so much stress in life. Um, there's less connectedness with people. Um, there's a breakdown of the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's just, life's gotten so much more difficult than, than what it was years and years ago. Yeah. And, and I think it'll continue to escalate uh, until Christ returns, yeah. so. Do you think, Pastor Hammock, that COVID is having any uh, impact on this, that well, it's making it worse? Do, because people are isolated. And when they're getting isolated, they don't get help. They don't reach out. And even statistics have shown that everything's increasing. Drug use, 
uh, abuse, uh, domestic violence, all these things are increasing because people need to touch people. And since we've isolated them, there's not a place for them to find hope. And step in there wherever you want. Yes, I, I, I must agree, uh, without a doubt, uh, because of this, uh, the COVID virus uh, that is out there, it's, it's isolated people more or where they're not able to get out. And I think uh, people are suffering with more depression and uh, they feel like there's no hope. Uh, but once again, we know that Christ, you know, if we can get people just to just to turn that way, you know, there's hope because he's the, mm -hmm. the he's where we find our Amen. hope. But Amen. without a doubt, this coronavirus has caused tremendous uh, stress upon families, people losing their jobs. And uh, even those who have done well are starting to regress and go back into that lifestyle because they feel that at times there's no hope. Mm, my goodness. Does, it, does, does COVID make it uh, next impossible to get to certain facilities perhaps like yours because you all may have had to shut down because of the virus? Or? Well, um, yes, there was conditions passed in the beginning that, that caused us to all kind of take a step back and just evaluate and, and um, you know, I looked a lot, a lot to science to get my facts to decide how we're gonna proceed forward. What, what, what are they telling us that works and what are they telling us that just isn't consistent? I'm looking for consistency and solutions. So when it comes to bringing folks um, to treatment, um, we just have to evaluate w which is more urgent right now. Mm -hmm. If their situation is critical, sometimes we have to set aside um, the, the conditions that have been set on us to serve someone. Um, so it's just, it's just prioritizing. But the common denominator that I see from the drugs in the 60s and 70s to now is, is a lack of hope. Uh, it's like Pastor said, it's just a lack of hope. That's never changed, even though the, the culture continues mm -hmm. to evolve. Yeah. Pastor Watson, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you, had, you lost a son to yes. drugs. And you know, with people watching in, I, I would like for you to just mention something that would be encouraging to these families. And, and well, I, I, I can, I can say this is that my son started probably using drugs when he was about uh, 15 years old. And uh, you know, like I said, being in ministry for over 30 years, uh, I really didn't, uh, I, I figured as a, you know, as a young fellow growing up, you know, you know how kids dip and dab in different things, yeah, but yeah. this had, uh, he was using the hard stuff and uh, we didn't find it out until uh, like I said, he started around 14, 15 years old, and before long, he was uh, out of the house. He wanted to get married, and he left. So we, uh, it was quite devastating to us because we didn't know right up under our nose, and we, we were not aware. So I would say to parents, make sure that you do the best you can uh, to try to know where your children are going know who they're hanging around with. That is so important because their business is your business. Yeah. And, uh, and as a Christian father, as a pastor, I uh, have you know, three sons. Uh, like I said, uh, it, it, it was really shocking to me because I, yeah. I, was, I was hurt. I was sure. surprised uh, uh, that I didn't know this right up under my nose, yeah. but it can happen. But having gone through this horrible experience, do you think now that it gives you some sort of an advantage in terms of reaching out to people? And also do people look at you knowing what you've been through uh, as having some sort of uh, unique credentials, if you could put it oh, that Oh, absolutely. Way? You know, when you go through something like this, you, you experience it. Uh, you know, it's nothing like experience. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so my heart goes out to those families that are hurting and I'm able to sympathize with them, yes. pray with them and feel their hurt. And uh, empathize, not just ab empathize. Absolutely. Wow. You see. What about some of the experiences that you all have? One of, one of the things that I'd like to just expand on a little bit is how um, it was a real learning curve for me, having never dealt with addiction um, that extensively, but uh, how those who are addicted become masters of deception. Yes. Um, they just, I've tried and tried to be able to figure out the, the folks that we work with at the Work Center, and it's so difficult to do. Uh, because we get limited time with them, of course, but then uh, you, you think, oh boy, this person's going to make it. They're just right on track and, yep. and doesn't yep. take very long and they relapse. Yep. Um, and then others, you go, oh my goodness, they're just, <laughs> they're setting themselves up for failure and they're the ones that succeed and it's, you know, it's great to see that. The one thing I have noticed out there, though, is that um, they have alumni days that they do every now and then when people who have successful, successfully completed the program, are able to come back and share, and, ah. and invariably, um, God played a big part in that. Mm, if, yeah. if they don't get yeah. involved in some kind of a, a spiritual 
uh, aspect of recovery, uh, we just don't see them again. Yeah. I would assume by that statement that whatever people are, are, are reaching out for, for help and for attention and the like, there must be a spiritual component to what they're seeking, whether they realize yes. it or not. Yes, it's a void there that only God can fill. And uh, as uh, the pastor was just saying uh, that, uh, you know, we see people regress. Uh, they seem like they're going to do well. And you say, well, he's going to do real good. Mm -hmm. In fact, we sent our son to Chicago, to the old lighthouse there to get help there at uh, Unshackled Ministries there in Chicago. And he was there for about three months close to three months, they have a nine month program that he should have completed. And I think it would have really helped him, but uh, he has some outside influence, uh, you know, that uh, kind of lured him back. And he wasn't, he just wasn't ready. He should have stayed. I'm not saying that would have been, a, been the whole answer, but it would have helped him spiritually, sure, sure. but he, he prematurely came back before he finished the program. And I think that really was a, was a great setback for him. How do you come back? outside influence that you're not even aware of a lot of times that even exists. How do you combat that? Well, one of the things is that, you know, since we've been doing this for about four years, uh, I have found out that many times, you know, the person needs to really get away uh, and sometimes not even come back to this particular communities. I'm working with about three or four of the ministries, uh, some uh, in Toledo, uh, some in uh, Tennessee. I just came back from Clinton, Ohio, where they have a ministry called New Destiny, where, you know, they're able to go in and stay there for nine months uh, for no charge. And, and it's a spiritual program. If it's not spiritual, I don't basically monkey around with it. And I'm not saying that there's not other programs out there that cannot help because they are. But I know it's a spiritual problem. It's, it's a spiritual problem that only Christ mm -hmm. can solve. Oh, oh. <clears throat> Anybody else have any comments on? So um, my, my own personal experience with, with my, my ministry spawning from my own addiction, um, I'd never been around the drug culture. I, I lost my leg in an accident and through that process of surgery after surgery became addicted to Vicodins. And um, one of the things that I discovered then and, and I, I now more can, can relate to from an empathetic standpoint mm -hmm. is, is that it, it, since I didn't come from the culture, I was forced into it through an accident. And a lot of folks end up that way from from injury to, a, to, to pain pills to, to heroin. Yeah. Um, that, that you spend a very short time uh, chasing the drug and then the rest of the time the drug chases you. So yes. that environment is huge because yeah. um, there's so many triggers. Uh, we had a, a, a music video playing in our church just recently mm -hmm. and two people who were clean less than a month, uh, there was a, a, a visual of a young girl injecting her arm and it, they both had a trigger from that. So environment is huge. It, it, People. It, it actually inspired them to go back into it. One yeah. of them, her legs just dropped out and she sat down. It, that visual had that kind of an impact on her. So now we have to preview all of our music videos because of our ministry. We have to preview the videos to make sure those visuals aren't there to cause a trigger. And Pastor Bill, he's telling you the truth because I've had him come in, uh, you know, men and women, and they would actually, you know, sit around and talk about, you know, some of the highs that they experienced. And they actually, I mean, you, you could just see the euphoria that when talking about it, like, man, I wish I could get that they high back it. again. They taste it. They taste yeah. it. And uh, so uh, we try to make sure we ch change that direction. You know, let's, let's get back to, you know, we don't want to talk about what, what's caused you to be in this situation. We want to get you out of this situation. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, but it, you're so right. There's triggers. There are triggers. And these are such, yeah. they're, they're in, and they're basically the, at, the, at the foundation, they're unclean spirits. So the only way to reduce an unclean spirit is with a clean spirit. A Holy yes. Spirit, so yeah, that's, so that's true. true. Amen. Yeah. We've got to take a break. We'll come back. I'd like to yeah. pick up on this and take it further. Stay with us, everybody. Uh, you don't want to miss uh, this conversation. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we are back and we will continue our discussion about drug recovery. These are four ministers, local ministers, who are concerned about the drug addiction problem in our communities and uh, they are doing something about it. 
What uh, we, we talked about, for instance, uh, that how COVID is affecting uh, the drug problem from the standpoint of uh, many feeling uh, great despair and turning to drugs because they just don't have a sense for where the future might be. How is this impacting other family members? Do you, do you see any of that? Well, in fact, uh, I've just uh, had a, a, a mother uh, whose uh, spouse has been incarcerated. Uh, he's going back to drinking, and uh, so they arrested him. And it's because, uh, I think, because of the COVID, uh, the job situation, once again, the economics, you know, mm -hmm. finance, as they say, romance and finance go together. So you, you start hurt, hurting in those areas, and it's, it's going to cause, it's going to have problems. So, uh, in fact, the, his wife is now coming, and she is learning quite a bit about what he's going through. Yes. So hopefully when he's out in a couple of months, she'll be able to uh, to minister to him. She, in fact, she's given her heart to Christ wow. uh, since the time. So that makes us very, very happy. My goodness, what a success story. Any other success story? One of the things that, uh, that I've noticed just in my personal experiences um, since the beginning of COVID, um, my, my relational counseling that is not addictive um, has went up within my congregation. Um, I, I just see meaning specifically uh, specifically it just seems like that that families are struggling with issues that now that everyone is confined everyone has taken on that issue I mean the extended families taken on that issue that's what it seems like there's one set of, one couple maybe has an issue but the extended family is getting involved and then it ends up uh, escalating to where now other people outside of the issue need individual mm -hmm. counseling so it's mm -hmm. it's not even addicted addiction related wow. um, it's increased quite a bit the pastoral counseling that's just relational that's, that's really a lot of time we forget the fact that, uh, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, as parents, you know, they have children and the children go through, you know, a lot yes. too psychologically. And I'm finding that to be the case that we need to also minister to the children uh, to let them know that there is hope. Because a lot of times when parents are going through this type of ordeal, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the children are somewhat pushed to the side. And that is something we have, we have to keep in mind that those children are suffering too psychologically and they need help as well. So we, we must make sure that we continue to minister to them as well. Yeah. Pastor Henry, you, you talked about the extend, extended yeah. care and the like you well, had. Well, looking at it, as my brother over there shared, you know, he got into drugs because of an injury. Yes. Okay. And that happens. But what we're finding out, and I've taken extensive training in trauma healing, is a lot of those in drugs, the, the drug is not the problem. They're trying to self-medicate a wound. Until mm. we deal with the wound, wound will mm. keep coming back again. It's sort of the old dandelion theory. You cut the grass off on Monday, Friday it's growing back up until you kill the root. Yeah. And the root are heart problems, okay? And a lot of times people don't even realize that they've been injured, but they've been something there, and now they're trying to deal with this, trying to process it. And so they take alcohol, they take drugs, or whatever may come in their lives, but they're trying to fill that. So we've decided to... Uh, do more with less people than less with more people. Can, can you give me a case study? Can you give me an example? I, I know you can't give away confidentialities and the like, I, I appreciate that. But uh, can you give me an example uh, when you, when you j just give me an example. Well, you find out uh, most of those in drugs, not all of them, most of them out there today come out of a, a single parent home, okay? There was never a father there, okay? There's never a situation there. There's something you know, going on there. They're looking for someone to care for them. A lot of these individuals out here are trying to find community. They've been broken, they've been hurt, okay? And that hurt then causes them to try to find something to at least live right. As I've talked with addicts, it's just, I just gotta be able to live with what my fears are. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we see uh, somebody who goes through a traumatic experience and, and um, they're, they're looking for something to ease that pain. And, and I think this is where the church fails. Um, and, and oftentimes I think it's because people don't go looking to the church, but, but somebody's there to say, well, I got something here that'll make you feel better. Where we as the church should have been there to say, we've got the person that'll make you feel better. Uh -huh. And when you look at the, the, the root or the foundation of this, it, it always goes back to unforgiveness. It always does. You know, really? Jeremiah, yes. oh yeah, Jeremiah yes. 1, five says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's yes. womb. So God, when he put the perfect embryo in the womb, he, he had a plan for that person at 25 years old. Yes. Uh, but because of circumstances in life, we're in this pinball machine of life, we end up being who we are. Mm -hmm. And then we enter in and we try to back up the clock to find those periods of unforgiveness. 
and then start moving them forward in Christ to become who he created you to be. So it's a process with some of these folks that you've got to go way back and there's many relapses in between and that's where the grace comes in and we just cannot give up on them. You're chomping at the bit. Well, so true. It's, it's because, like you said, it's the thing we can't give up on them. And sorry to say, most churches today, uh, I mean, and it's sorry to say this, but they don't want to embrace those who are suffering with addiction. And that's what the church is there for. We're what, a hospital. Well, what is it like? What, what do you have to deal with if you're putting up with a, putting up with a person with an addiction? Well, you've got to, you, you, you have to expect that it's a possible they're going to relapse. And, you know, you, you're you praying that they don't, but yeah. you've got to let them know, regardless of what happens, we're going to be there for you. We love you. We love you with the, with the love of Christ. We're going to continue to be there for you and love you. And there is hope in Jesus. And we're going to beat this thing if you just stay with us. If you will just uh, give Jesus a chance. I said, now many of you say, you know, we want to try Jesus. You don't try Jesus. You put Jesus on. And I tell them that, you know, he said, well, I've tried. No, I say, you've tried, but you don't. We're not here to try it. We're going to put Jesus on and we're going to walk through this together, you see. And, and, and they feel that hope. And now, like I said, most churches today, uh, they see somebody that was dealing with drugs. Sorry to say, Christians don't want to be bothered with them. I mean, they just, you know, they just, for some reason, they treat them like they have the, 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 the bluebonic plague. Well, we're the hospital. And I tell people yeah. that we're a hospital. We want you. We love you because Jesus loves you. Yeah. So don't feel that we're judging you. We want you to come just the way you are. Let God do the work that he's going to do in you. And it's going to take time. And I tell people that's on our staff because sometimes they get discouraged because they sure, see sure. people do good for a while. And then they start to regress and then they fall off. You don't see them. And then three months later, they show up again. So there is hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. I, I think part, part of the problem is in the churches, though, is the fact that people just don't know and don't understand exactly. about addiction. Uh, one of the things that I noticed with my church is uh, at one time, we were able to bring some of the ladies from the Worship Center out to worship with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we could do that on a monthly basis. And, and the comment I heard the most that just puzzled me to no end was, well, they look just like us. And I thought, well, <laughs> what do you expect them to look like? Um, yeah. You know, they're not going to come out here wearing striped suits or <laughs> <Right>. orange <laughs> jumpsuits or whatever. But, um, but I think people are just, they have that natural fear wow. of, you know, that's someone who's in prison, somebody who's addicted. Uh, you don't know what to expect. And, and, and so we, we need to really kind of condition our folks. Yes. And, and we need to let them know that, that when these folks get out of incarceration, especially with the, the addiction program that I'm working with now, is that we have to walk with them side mm -hmm. by side. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't just let them get out and right. just dump them because, um, because you're just setting them up to fail. Exactly. Somebody needs to help them. They have got to have somebody to, to walk beside them, to be there when they call at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I need some help. They've got to be discipled, I guess, huh? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Without, without so, a question. I can give you a case study. There was a man that came to my church eight years ago, and um, in that eight years, this is the rockiest ground that we've ever tried to plant a seed in. In that eight years, he'd done two prison stints and many, many, many relapses. And, and, but I kept going back, even though my flesh was getting frustrated and I wanted to just walk away. Mm -hmm. I remembered all the men who never gave up on me when I was in my addiction. So that was what, you know, it wasn't my strength, it was the strength others showed me that helped me carry through. But um, six months ago, this man started doing Bible studies in the very recovery houses that he used to reside in. So persistence pays off, it's discipleship. And that's not just showing up at church, that's, God gives you one person. Jesus had 12. He fed 5,000, but he just had 12 in his circle to disciple. And that's what we need is those individual relationships where it's daily contact, walking them through the process. And yes, it's exhausting in the flesh, but in the spirit, I can do all things through yeah. Christ who gives me strength. Now, you mentioned earlier that you had, an, you had had an accident and you were given certain pills, uh, pain painkillers and the like, and you got, you got hooked on those. Yeah. Did you, were you a minister at that time? No, Before no I was not a man a of God at that time. Okay. Um, my experience with, with meeting the Lord was when I finally ran out of the means legally to get the pills. And I had five nights of no sleep from withdrawal. And I met the Lord Jesus Christ in his spirit uh, when I was going to break into Schwederman's drugstore at 2 a.m. one night to get the pills I needed. Um, I heard a voice that all it said was, this affects more than you. It, 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 it didn't say don't get the, don't break into the drugstore, but it reminded me of my wife, kids, and grandkids coming to see me in prison. Oh. And all it did was just change my path that night by one degree. 
and I started chasing that voice. I was still an addict for two more years, but that voice was what eventually set me free from the addiction, the lust, the anger, and all the other different things associated with the addiction. So, did, did, was, was guilt a part of that at all? Oh my goodness. I was spending money my wife didn't even know about. It. And the day that I confessed that to her, I wanted to have my bags packed by the door to make my leaving easier when she threw me out. But um, she always been a woman of God and her grace was sufficient. And she just said, "Really, we'll get through this. We've gotten through more. And I'd ran us up to countless dollars in debt from my addiction. I didn't understand the culture to know where to get them at, so I was doing the online illegal purchases and um, maintaining my, my addiction that way. Do, do you get any opportunities to share your story with people? I mean, that, isn't that story Every repeated day. over and over again with yes. other, other people? God has refined it down to an elevator speech. When I'm getting my coffee at Speedway in 30 seconds, I can give them my testimony. And usually they don't want to leave then. They want to hear the, because wow. I, I, they just ask me, how's your day? And I just say, I woke up not an addict again. And that oh locks them in, and I can tell my story and witness to them about I what the Lord Jesus up. Christ has done in my life. And uh, yeah, I, I, I woke up a hundred times a day. I cannot not give that testimony. I mean, if somebody said that to me, I woke up not an addict again. I mean, it, it would stop me dead in my oh, tracks to want to hear more. Yes. That's I, incredible. I found out most time when you're working with, with those in addiction, you have to have patience, yeah. okay? Because wow. they'll take two steps forward and three back in the same day. Mm. These are wounded, hurting people, and they have a culture that we have to break. Because in that culture, they have, they've learned to come together. Darkness has brought them together. Exactly. And that's why it's important you bring them into an atmosphere where they are accepted for who Christ has made them, not what you see in them. It's like peeling an onion. It's one layer at a time. Yeah. And a lot of these individuals, when they become a Christian, they're not baby Christians anymore. I call them ICU preemie baby. I had a granddaughter <laughs> who was two pounds, 13 ounces. I watched her in Toledo when they had uh, uh, needles and tubes in her, okay? She needed constant care. Yeah. When addicts become a Christian, they're like that. They're not like the average person, come to church, okay, we got a nice little family. Yeah, we need to raise our children in church. These people are dealing with such deep wounds and hurt. They need that, they need to make that connection. And sometimes it's hard for them to do that because they've been hurt, Yes. they've been rejected. And it's hard for them to build trust. They have to know that you care more than anything else. That's the only thing. They don't care what you know, how much Bible you know, how much information. They want to know that you care. And love has to be the, the force behind it. Yes. Otherwise, we cannot penetrate that wall. So true. So yeah. true. You know, and I, let me say this is that, you know, in our ministry, we're limited to what we can do in the sense that we can only take them so far. But there comes a time where people have to be housed uh, in, in a place where they're going to be uh, ministered to 24 seven. And uh, what I've done over the years is found good places where I can send people uh, to help them uh, to grow and to prayerfully uh, be completely delivered. That's all the time we have, but let's end it there. But uh, Boy, I sure love to hear more. The stories you have are, are tremendous. We thank you for your success stories. Mm -hmm. But I should mention this, this panel will be back again with us next week. So you want to stay tuned for next week's program. We'll talk about more and uh, we'll also get into how COVID-19 has impacted the fight against drug addiction. So be with us next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye bye. Be safe. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.